Two attractive women dining on the restaurant's terrace attracted male glances from passersby, but the friends were too busy talking to each other to pay attention to them. How long ago was it, Melanie? Asked a tall, dark-haired woman. It seems to me that I haven't seen you for ages. The second woman was blundy and a year or two younger than her friend. I know, Gary, and I feel bad about it. But between graduate school and family life, it was difficult to find time for anything else. How are your studies at business school going? You must be close to completing your MBA. Yes, almost everything is ready. We have spring break next week, and then there are only a few weeks of classes left before I receive my diploma. I've already turned in my thesis, so I don't have to worry about that. And even better, it looks like I'll be exempt from all exams. Then everything should be smooth. This is wonderful, Melanie. Congratulations. Do you already have a job? No. I've been really busy the last two years, so I'm planning on taking a little break before getting into the labor wars. I want to relax and have some fun before I get back to work. But enough about me, how are you doing? Is there a special man in your life? I'm doing well, but I'm still looking for the right mister. The blonde looked at her brunette friend with an appraising glance. With your appearance, I wouldn't rush to settle down. I bet you could go out with different guys every night if you wanted. Jerry gave her friend a sarcastic smile. Believe me, Melanie, living alone these days isn't all it's cracked up to be. To find one decent guy, you have to go through a dozen scoundrels. And frankly, it starts to get boring. To tell you the truth, I'm a little jealous of you being happily married to such a wonderful guy like Adam. And speaking of Adam, how is your handsome husband doing? I think he's fine. I think I just heard a discouraging word. What's the matter, Melanie? Isn't everything good between you? The blonde shook her head. It's not that we have problems. It's just that Adam is so busy with his own affairs that we have little time to spend time together. And even when we do, we don't have much money to spend on entertainment. Well, he spends all this time on his company to build a future for the two of you. As for money, I suspect that graduate school is not cheap. I know and I appreciate it. But sometimes I just want to go out and have fun like I used to. At school, all my classmates talk about is going to parties and meeting people in bars. Meanwhile, I'm sitting at home and watching reruns on TV. The dark-haired woman looked shrewdly at her friend. Is there anyone in particular at school that you would like to go to a party with? Melanie laughed. You always knew how to read me too well. She then leaned forward to avoid being overheard. Actually, there is one freshman, Carl. He's very nice, she blushed. And he definitely likes me too. Every time we're together, he goes out of his way to say something really nice about how good I look and how well I'm doing at school. Carrie shook her head. I don't think Adam will be very happy to hear about this. It's just harmless flirting. It doesn't mean anything. But you're right. Adam is pretty old-fashioned about this sort of thing. That's why I'm not going to tell him. She shifted in her chair. But I can't help but remember how everything was before I got married. It was so much fun playing on the field and meeting all the different guys. I miss it all. You need to be careful, friend. You have a very good husband and you shouldn't risk losing him. You know Adam will never tolerate it if he catches you fooling around. And if you ever did, I'm willing to bet there are plenty of other women who would be more than happy to comfort him afterwards. I know, I know, and honestly, I want to spend my whole life with him, start a family and all that. I just wanted to have a little fun before things get so serious. She lowered her voice and leaned closer again. Speaking of the guy I told you about, yesterday he asked me to go to Florida with him for spring break. If there was some way to do this without Adam finding out, I'd probably agree. She leaned back and laughed dismissively. But this is just a fantasy. It will never happen. Jerry sat down and looked at Melanie for a long time. Finally, she nodded her head as if she had made a decision. Don't be so sure. I know how you can do this and get away with it. Melanie let out a sigh that was equal parts disbelief and delight. Are you kidding? How? Are you sure you want to jeopardize your marriage just for a week-long fling? If I could be sure that Adam would never find out, then why not? But you're just teasing me, Gary. There's no way I could get away with something like that. Yes, and in fact, it's quite simple. Jerry began to postpone each step on her fingers. First, you need to create a new mailbox on mail. Get him under some anonymous name, something like good friend. You then use this account to send Adam an anonymous letter warning him that his wife is having an affair. Will I tell him that I'm having an affair? This is crazy. Why would I do this? Jerry continued calmly. More precisely, you would write that Melanie is having an affair with some person whom Adam does not know and cannot easily verify. And what will this give? It'll take his attention away from your hot guy from grad school. Yes, but it will make Adam suspicious of me, exactly. But when he fails to find the guy you're supposed to be having an affair with, 
He'll have no choice but to confront you and demand to know what's going on. But I don't want him to suspect me. No, you don't want to. So when he confronts you, you will be very angry with him for not trusting you. In fact, you'll get so angry that you'll call time out on your marriage. Doesn't your mom live in Florida? Melanie was taken by surprise by the sudden change. Yes, why? Great, angrily you tell Adam that you are going to Florida for spring break to be with your mother and figure out what to do with your marriage. Then, while he's here in town desperately trying to find the mystery man, you're in Florida with Carl having your own little fling. How will I explain all this to my mother? Jerry rolled her eyes. You shouldn't. In fact, you shouldn't even see your mother while you're there. But what if Adam calls her? Tell him not to do it. Make it clear that you need a complete break to sort things out. He shouldn't try to contact you or your mother while you're away. Warn him that if he tries, you might not come home at all. Melanie stared at her friend for a moment, contemplating her plan. Finally, her face brightened. You know, Gary, I can see how this could work, but what will happen when I return? It's simple by then. Adam will miss you like crazy. And since he can't find the mysterious man who is supposedly having an affair with you, he will come to the conclusion that someone is playing a malicious prank on him. He will feel very guilty and will beg you to forgive him for not trusting you. You will forgive him and everything will be fine. You'll have fun and then you and Adam will be together again, closer than ever. What about the mysterious man I'm supposed to be having an affair with? Maybe I should just come up with a name for him. You can, but I think it will be much more believable if it is a real person. Choose someone you can't have an affair with like someone very old or living far away or dead. That way, if Adam manages to track him down, you'll be safe. Hey, I think I know the perfect guy. I had a creepy professor in one of my classes my first year of graduate school. He must have left town because I never saw him again. How do you like it? Perfect. Melanie suddenly reached across the table and squeezed her friend's hand. You are the best, Jerry. I'm so excited. I really think it's going to work. Then she hugged herself and trembled slightly. I can't wait to tell Carl. Adam returned to his office and sat down in his second-hand swivel chair. He rubbed his forehead worriedly. If these parts do not appear soon, we will miss the deadline for the delivery of prototypes. After the foreman left, Adam sat trying to come up with a backup plan. When his email dinged, he quickly turned to check his inbox, hoping for good news. But when he saw that the subject of the letter was about your wife, he almost delighted it. But curiosity got the better of him and he opened the message. I hate to tell you this, but Melanie is having a romance with Professor Bellingham. I just thought you should know. Good friend? What the heck? Stunned, Adam reread the message again, unable to comprehend the terrible words. What nonsense is this? It cannot be true. Melanie wouldn't cheat on me. Someone must be trying to stir up trouble between us. But who does this and why? He started to delete the message but hesitated. That's the last thing I need to deal with right now. This must be a mistake, a misunderstanding. But his practical side did not allow him to ignore it. Damn it, damn it, of course it can't be true. Angrily, he pressed the reply button on the email. Who are you? Why are you making such a terrible accusation? What evidence do you have? He pressed send and then stared at the screen in impotent rage. This won't lead to anything good. It is unknown when or if this guy will answer, and there's no way to track it. It's probably best to start finding out who this Bellingham guy is. He opened a browser, went to the university's webpage, and searched for the Graduate School of Business Department. Professor Bellingham was not on staff. He returned to the faculty register and began searching throughout the university, and again he was unlucky. Frustrated, he tried looking at other educational institutions in the area, but to no avail. This is madness, he muttered to himself. Did my good friend just make up a name? He then tried a Google search, and the search engine quickly returned five names. But two of them were female, and neither was local. I knew it was fake. Someone is trying to prank me or drive me crazy. But again, he could not bring himself to delete the letter. Now that the letter had been sent, a seed of doubt began to grow in his mind. God, what if she's having an affair? I didn't see any signs, but that doesn't mean anything. Besides, I was so busy at work that I hardly spent any time with her. What if she was upset because she was being ignored? I remember that there were times when she wanted to go somewhere for fun, and I refused her. But damn, I'm working almost 70 hours a week trying to get the business going. Doesn't she understand this? Can't she see that I'm doing all this for us? And to be honest, we really can't afford anything extravagant. Her business school tuition is getting more expensive every year, and I'm pouring whatever is left into this place to try to speed up the process. And yet, I guess I neglected her. 
Feeling guilty, he started checking his calendar trying to find the last time they met together. After scrolling through three months and finding nothing, he stopped searching. Damn, damn, damn. But even as his guilt increased, he felt a corresponding surge of anger. I may not have given Melanie as much attention as she wanted, but that doesn't give her the right to cheat on me. We also discussed what sacrifices we would have to make when we decided to start the business. She agreed 100% then, so she hardly has any right to complain now. His thoughts were interrupted when his foreman poked his head through the doorway. Hey, Adam, good news. The components we need have just arrived. God bless. His foreman poked his head through the doorway. Hey, Adam, good news. The components we need have just arrived. God bless. Okay, we need to unpack them and get them to the workshop as soon as possible. When the foreman disappeared, Adam took a deep breath. Well, in any case, one crisis is averted. He smiled wryly. I think this means I can spend more time taking care of my wife. After spending even more time searching the internet fruitlessly, he sat back and tried to think. If Mel really is having an affair, then it simply has to be with someone from the university. Maybe my good friend got his name wrong, or maybe the university just didn't put his name on their website. He returned to the university's webpage and found the phone number for the Human Resources Department. When the secretary answered his call, he asked if Professor Bellingham was on the faculty. Which faculty, please? I think it's the Graduate School of Business, but I'm not sure. There was a pause, and then the voice came back on the line. I'm very sorry, sir, but we don't have Professor Bellingham in the School of Business. What about other schools? There was a sigh. Please wait. This time we had to wait longer. When the woman finally returned to the line, her manners had disappeared. Sir, there is no Professor Bellingham at the university. A thought struck him. Maybe he was an employee a year or two ago. I can only confirm our current teaching staff. Why? That is university policy, sir. Is there anything else I can help you with? No, you did your best, he said, trying not to sound too sarcastic. He tried again, calling the dean of the business school. He went back and forth with the administrative assistant. But in the end, he learned nothing more. By this time, Adam's head was throbbing. I need a good drink, he muttered, hanging up in disgust. But this thought gave him an idea, and he picked up the phone again. Hello, Gary, this is Adam. Listen, any chance you could meet me after work at Macy's place for a drink? I have a problem, and I really need your advice. No, I wouldn't like to talk about this on the phone. Can I? Great, I'll meet you there at 6 go. Before leaving, he checked his email again. There were no more messages from good friend. Entering Maxie's place, Adam noticed Gary sitting at a table in a quiet corner. In front of her stood a glass of white wine and a mug of his favorite draft beer. He walked over and kissed her on the cheek. Thank you for the beer and, more importantly, for coming tonight. I really needed to talk to you. When he sat down, she took a sip of wine and then looked at him for a long time. Okay, Adam, tell me what's going on. Are there problems in your business? Not knowing where to start, he stared at his mug for a moment and then said, Do you happen to know Professor Bellingham from the university? She shook her head, puzzled. Bellingham? I've never heard of him. And what? He sighed and handed her a printout of the email. I received this today. She quickly scanned it, sighed, and read it again. Then she looked at him with sympathetic eyes. Poor Adam. No wonder you didn't want to talk about it on the phone. What do you think about it? I don't know what to think, Jerry. I can't believe this is true, but I also don't want to bury my head in the sand and pretend everything is fine. I spent the whole day trying to track down this mysterious Bellingham professor, but I ran into a brick wall at the university. Now I don't know what to do. I can't afford to hire a private detective and I don't have time to play detective myself. That's why I wanted to talk to you. You have been a good friend to Melanie and me for a long time. Please tell me what you think about it. She took another sip of wine and then reached out to give his hand a quick squeeze. What you're really asking is, do I think she's having an affair? I cannot give you such absolute certainty. On the one hand, I haven't seen or heard anything that would make me think that she is unfaithful to you. On the other hand, I haven't seen her very often over the past few months. His face twisted in annoyance and she hurried to continue. You know as well as I do that there are people who like to stir things up, and it could be something like this. Or you may have business enemies who would like you to divert attention to the tensions in your marriage. There may be other scenarios that I haven't even thought about. What I do know is that you can't ignore it and hope it goes away. I know how much you believe in marital fidelity, and I know that any hint that your marriage has been broken will eat away at you. If you don't deal with this, then eventually doubt will kill your relationship with Melanie as effectively as the romance. He looked at her hauntedly. I understand that you are right, Gary, but what can I do? In my opinion, you should show this damn thing to Melanie. 
She needs to know that someone has accused her of infidelity, and she deserves the opportunity to shed whatever light she has on it. After all, Adam, if someone made a similar accusation against you, you'd want to know, wouldn't you? He sat silently for a minute, then nodded his head. You're right, if I don't share this with Melanie, it will affect how I behave with her. Ultimately, this will tear us apart just as surely as if she actually cheated on me. He stood up and hugged the dark-haired woman. Thanks for helping me think things through, Gary. I don't know what I would do without you. You know how dear you both are to me, Adam. If I can help in any way, please let me know. He nodded gratefully and headed towards the door, and she stood and looked after him. When he returned home, Melanie was already waiting for him. Where have you been, Adam? I tried to call, but you didn't answer. He ignored her question. Taking her hand, he led her to the sofa and sat down next to her. I have to show you something, Mel, something that has really confused me. She sat down next to him, her face betraying her nervousness. He handed her the printout. I received this by email today. Can you tell me anything about this? She read it quickly. Then, to his surprise, she jumped up and started screaming. Do you think I'm cheating on you? I do not believe in this. You got some bullshit accusation from some anonymous friend, and you're ready to accuse me of adultery? No, no, honey, I don't blame you for anything. I, if you don't blame me, then why did you show me these dirty lies? She snatched the printout, crumpled it into a ball, and threw it at him. You might as well plunge a knife into my heart. This hurts me so deeply. You trust someone who is too cowardly to even sign his name more than you trust your own wife. She grabbed her purse and headed to the front door. I can't even look at you now. I'm leaving and don't know when I'll be back. With these words, she ran out, slamming the door behind her. A moment later, he heard the roar of her car's engine and then the screech of tires as she pulled out of their driveway. Damn, I never expected this. Now and even worse than before. He groaned, sinking back onto the sofa and clasping his head in his hands. As he sat there, Adam's first thoughts were defensive. Why was she so upset? She didn't even let me finish. I didn't accuse her of cheating. I just showed her what someone else wrote, that's all. But he knew the answer before he finished. If Mel had given me that note, I probably would have exploded too. But what could I do? Act like everything was fine. Jerry was right. I can't just ignore the letter. It wouldn't be fair to Mel or me. Even though he spent the rest of the evening going over the situation in his mind, he was no closer to figuring out what to do than when he started. He knew he and Mel needed to talk, but he couldn't even decide what to tell her. All he knew for sure was that he wanted to bring his wife home to try to mend the relationship. All he knew for sure was that he wanted to bring his wife home to try to mend the relationship. Emotionally exhausted, Adam felt himself starting to get tired, but he was determined to stay up until Melanie returned. After another hour of waiting, he laid down on the sofa and soon fell asleep. Sometime after midnight, he was awakened by the sound of the door opening. As he stood up, Melanie walked into the living room and stared at him with her hands on her hips. Mel, we really need. I don't want to talk about this now. She interrupted him sharply. You can stay the night on the couch and we'll talk in the morning. Without waiting for an answer, she turned on her heel and headed down the hallway to their bedroom. Hearing the door slam, he groaned and lay back on the couch, hoping that sleep would return. It took a long time. Adam usually got up early to get to the office before everyone else. But even though his body clock woke him up at the usual time, he felt obligated to not leave until Melanie showed up so they could talk. He felt obligated to not leave until Melanie showed up so they could talk. He made coffee and sat down at his laptop to read the news while he waited. It was almost 8 o'clock when Melanie entered the kitchen. Adam was shocked to see her dragging a suitcase behind her. Where are you going, Melanie? I thought we were going. Before he could finish, she raised her hand to stop him. It was a terrible shock, Adam. I thought we were going. Before he could finish, she raised her hand to stop him. It was a terrible shock, Adam. This calls into question our entire marriage. I need to be alone to think about what happened. Spring break starts tomorrow and I'm going to Florida to visit my mother. She pierced him with an angry look. I plan to spend the whole week there and return to classes next Monday. While I'm gone, I don't want to hear a word from you. I need this time for myself. Don't call me. Don't call my mother. Don't call my mother's house. Do you understand? He nodded helplessly. I'm serious, Adam. If you try to call, I might not come home at all. Understood. He nodded again. Okay, she said and walked out the door to her car, dragging her suitcase behind her. When she left, Adam sat in shock for several minutes. Finally, he returned to the bathroom to shave and change his clothes. Then he gloomily drove to work. When he got to the office, good news awaited him. His foreman took the lead in distributing the missing components to the appropriate stations on the model production line, 
and testing proceeded smoothly. At least the business won't crash and burn today. Unlike my marriage, Adam said to himself bitterly. In the afternoon, he was working on a spreadsheet when the phone rang. When he answered, he heard that Jerry was on the line. I was worried and wanted to know how you were doing. How did it go last night with Melanie? Well, it's a long, sad story, he said dejectedly. That doesn't sound very good. Maybe we can get together to discuss this again over a drink. That would be great, Jerry. Same place, okay. Before leaving, he checked his email again. But there was still nothing from Goodfriend. When he entered the bar, Jerry immediately noticed the dark circles under his eyes. Adam, it looks like you didn't get much sleep last night. Tell me what happened. He took a long sip from his beer mug and began to talk about yesterday's confrontation and Melanie's departure this morning. Jerry looked at him with a mixture of sadness and guilt. Oh, Adam, I feel so terrible. You followed my advice, and it turned out to be completely wrong. No, Jerry, I thought about it a lot, and I'm convinced that it was the only thing I could do. Of course, I didn't expect Mel to react so violently, but there was no way I could keep this letter to myself and pretend that nothing had happened. Now I can only hope that she will cool down and we can discuss everything when she gets home. You say that very nicely, Adam, but I still feel guilty about what happened. So what are you going to do for the rest of this week? You say that very nicely, Adam, but I still feel guilty about what happened. So what are you going to do for the rest of this week? I don't know, Jerry. If Mel and I don't talk about what happened, I don't see any way to move forward. Maybe I'll wait a few days and then try calling her. No, Adam, this is the only thing you shouldn't do. She already thinks that you don't trust her. If you try to contact her after she has directly told you not to, it will only prove to her that she was right. Yes, I guess I understand that, but I feel so damn helpless. I don't know of a way to find out who sent the letter. The only thing I can do while she's gone is continue to try to figure out who this Professor Bellingham is. This makes a lot of sense. If you could find him, maybe he could fill in some of the blanks for you. Over the next few days, Adam repeatedly tried to unravel the mystery of the anonymous letter. Despite the lack of success, he was still convinced that Bellingham was somehow connected to the university. Then he started brainstorming. Maybe the reason I can't find this guy is because he is a graduate and not a teacher. Well, I'm an alumnus too, so maybe alumni relations can help. When he called and identified himself as a graduate, Adam was immediately transferred to the development department. The guy who answered the phone wrote down all the necessary information about Adam's address, phone number, and email. He then asked how much Adam wanted to contribute to the alumni fund. No, no, I'm not calling to make a contribution. I'm trying to find Professor Bellingham. I think he might be a graduate. The man made him wait while he checked several databases. Sorry, sir, but it seems we've never had a graduate with that name. Is it true? What about graduate schools? I checked them too. Perhaps he is not a graduate. Perhaps he simply studied for a year or two and then dropped out or transferred. The guy seemed to have lost interest. I'm afraid I can't help you. Our database contains only graduates. Is there I'm afraid I can't help you? Our database contains only graduates. Is there anything else I can do for you? After Adam turned him down, he hung up and cursed in frustration. Damn it, all I managed to achieve was to guarantee that I would be invited to the next alumni fundraising campaign. Having made no progress on the phone or the line, he took an hour off the next day to visit the Graduate School of Business. When he got there, it was almost empty. At spring break, dumbest Adam cursed to himself. But several people were still found, and he began to walk from one office to another, asking for information about Professor Bellingham. Finally, the assistant dean met him face to face. Sir, I'm very sorry, but you will have to leave. If you do not comply, we will be forced to call campus security. Adam apologized and hurried away, more upset than ever. Returning to his office, he sat down heavily at his desk. After another futile check of email, he dropped his head into his hands. What should I do now? At that moment, his work phone rang. When Adam answered, an unfamiliar voice asked, Are you the young man looking for Professor Bellingham? When Adam confirmed that yes, the man continued, My name is Dr. Avery Mayfair. I am a member of the Graduate School of Business faculty and may be able to help you. But first, let me ask you why you're trying to find Professor Bellingham. Adam was hesitant to discuss his situation with a stranger, but desperation took over, and he briefly told Dr. Mayfair why he was looking for the missing professor. When he finished, a caller made a contemplative sound. It's clear. I overheard your questions at school today, and the way you presented some of the questions made me wonder if there might be something similar. Anyway, I think I can reassure you, young man. Two years ago, Bellingham was an adjunct professor at the graduate school. He was a worthy teacher, 
but unfortunately enrollment in his course was below our minimum requirements. His course was canceled and his contract was not renewed. I see, said Adam. This means there's one more thing. Dr. Mayfair continued. At the beginning of the current academic year, I received a message from Professor Bellingham. He wrote to tell me that he had found a job at Black Hills State University in South Dakota. Is he in South Dakota? Adam asked in bewilderment. That's right, the professor confirmed. And there's something else you might want to know. In the same message, Professor Bellingham informed me of his recent wedding to his longtime partner, Harold. Harold? This means Bellingham? Exactly. Dr. Mayfair, thank you very much for your call. I still don't understand why someone sent me such a treacherous letter, but now I'm sure it was a lie. I was hoping I could calm you down. Sir, may I ask one more question? Why did you decide to call me? Don't get me wrong, I'm very grateful, but I'm just a stranger to you. The professor's tone of voice changed. I don't mind telling you, young man, many years ago, something very similar happened to me. My wife left me to run off with her lover, so I have deep sympathy for anyone who may find themselves in a similar situation. Fortunately, in this case, the warning you received turned out to be false. So I'm glad that I was able to dispel your doubts. But as you can imagine, I have very strong feelings towards anyone who interferes in a marriage. If this statement were true, I would not hesitate to tell you. Thank you, sir. You have no idea how much I appreciate what you did. That evening, Adam called Gary to tell her the good news. I still don't know who is trying to destroy my marriage, but now I know for sure that Mel is not having an affair with Professor Bellingham. Are you sure you can trust this, Dr. Mayfair? Absolutely. After the call, I looked him up and found him on the business school faculty. He is an elderly man, probably around 60, and appears to be well-respected. But just to be sure, I also checked out Bellingham on the Black Hills website. Of course he was there. That's great, Adam. You must be extremely relieved. Yes, it is. But now my problem is what to tell Mel when she gets home. It's easy, Adam. From what you told me about your confrontation with her, she never gave you a chance to talk. When she returns, tell her that you never had any doubts about her. Tell her that you already knew about Bellingham, that you tracked him down as soon as you received the letter. But since she reacted so strongly, you didn't have a chance to tell her about it. If you play your cards right, Adam, she'll apologize to you. I don't know, Jerry. In fact, everything was not like that. He heard the smile in her voice. Come on, Adam, is it really that bad to stretch the truth a little to get what you want? On Sunday before returning to town, Melanie surprised Gary with a phone call. Hey, girlfriend, I just wanted to check with you about how Adam is doing before I go home. I'm a little nervous about what I'll encounter when I arrive. The only thing I know for sure is that you owe me a huge debt for everything I did for you while you were busy with your affair. With a little help from me and some luck, you will be able to return to your husband and your marriage will be in better shape than ever. With that, she continued to describe the week, ending with Adam learning of Bellingham's whereabouts. If you play your cards right when you get home, Adam will apologize to you, you will apologize to him, and everything in your life will go back to normal. There was a pause on the line. What if I don't want everything to go back to normal? I didn't understand, Melanie. What do you want to say? Just last week I had an explosion. Carl, the guy I was with, is so funny. Melanie's voice became a little hoarse. And most importantly, he is a fantastic lover. I haven't felt such pleasure for many years. In any case, I'm not ready for my little adventure to end yet. I want to continue seeing him at least until the end of the semester. Come on, Gary, you have to help me find a way to help me out. Stop, Melanie. You're already taking a big risk by leaving with this guy for a week. If you try to keep the romance alive here in town, you're really upping the odds, girl. Maybe, but you have to admit your little plan worked perfectly. I bet you can figure out how I can do this again. Come on, Jerry, please. This guy is really hot. I was afraid that something like this might happen. There was a long pause. Okay, Jerry said slowly. I can come up with a plan to do what you want. But you have to understand that you will jeopardize your marriage to Adam. He's a good guy, Melanie. He is hardworking, loyal, and a true family man. Men like him don't come along every day. Are you sure you want to risk it all for a little fun between the sheets? Melanie chuckled. You turned me on with the phrase, I can come up with a plan. Okay, but don't say I didn't warn you. Now here's what you need to do. Do you still have that email account you created? Certainly, you told me to keep it active. Good, because you need to send another letter from good friend. Only this time, you will send a message to yourself, to your regular email. Okay, then what will be in the new letter? Everything is exactly the same as in the previous one. Only this time you write that Adam is having an affair with me? What? But that's not true, and Adam knows it. 
How can this help? It's simple. The first letter accused you of having an affair. Adam has discovered that you could not have been unfaithful with Professor Bellingham, but he may still have doubts about your fidelity. Wait, Gary. Did you tell me that a letter with Bellingham would give me freedom in my relationship with Carl? So it was, but now, after he receives the second letter, he will have no doubts. It's already proven that you weren't having an affair with Bellingham, and he knows for sure that he's not having an affair with me, that you weren't having an affair with Bellingham, and he knows for sure that he's not having an affair with me. Obviously, the good friend is a complete liar, which means Adam has no reason to doubt you anymore. This means that you can get away with almost anything you want without arousing Adam's suspicion. There was silence on the line. Melanie then exclaimed, Jerry, you are a genius. I don't know how you came up with all this, but you just gave me a hall pass that I can use for the rest of the semester. There are two more things you need to do, Melanie. First, make sure Adam tells me about the second letter. Okay, but why? Because this way I can reinforce the idea that you are trustworthy and this unknown friend is not. It's good he really cares about you, so he will listen to your advice. Now what else? After you send the message to yourself, remember to log out of your good friend email account. What if Adam accidentally finds him? God, no. In fact, you should probably sign out of both of your email accounts when you're not using them. You don't want Adam to find love notes from Carl, do you? I warned Carl never to email me, but this is still good advice. Better safe than sorry. Returning home from work that evening, Adam was alarmed to find Melanie crying. Things had been going so well between them since she returned from Florida that the sight of her upset face took him by surprise. What's wrong with you, Mel? What's happened? He asked, rushing towards her. Adam, it's all starting again, she said with tears in her eyes, handing him a copy of the letter. Son of a bitch, he swore after reading the accusatory message. You know that's a lie, don't you? Certainly cute. I know that you will never cheat on me, just as I will never cheat on you. And even if you cheated, I know it would never happen with Gary. She is such a good friend to both of us that she would never do anything like that. Damn it, someone is still trying to cause trouble for us, and I have no idea who or why. There must be some way to track these things. She looked up at him hesitantly. Are you going to tell Jerry about this? Do you think I should? I think you should. Whether you like it or not, she's involved now. It would be unfair to her not to tell her about this. The next morning when Adam called, Gary answered in a friendly manner. Well, how are the two lovebirds doing today? Adam's tone was solemn. We're doing well, Jerry, but there's something new that I need to talk to you about. Can you meet after work? Actually, I plan to work at home after lunch. Could you come to my house? Okay, good. I'll come in between 6.30 and 7. Opening the door to her apartment in the evening, Jerry immediately noticed the solemn expression on Adam's face. What's the matter, Adam? I've been worried since you called. He shook his head. I'm really sorry, Gary, but it looks like you got caught up in this whole thing with Melanie and me. When she looked at him in confusion, he handed her a copy of the last letter. After reading it, she looked at Adam in despair. But it's just funny we don't have an affair. I would never do that to Melanie. I hope she knows that. He nodded, she knows. In fact, she told me the same thing. Carrie shook her head in confusion. Glad to hear that. But what do you think this all means? I think this means that someone is very keen to stir up trouble between Melanie and me. First a warning about Professor Bellingham, now this. The only thing I can think of is that I have an enemy, perhaps a business competitor, but I have no idea who it could be. But anyway, since it now seems to concern you, Mel and I decided we should warn about it. She nodded, I'm glad you did it, Adam. You are always so caring, but I don't know what we can do about it, unless the mystery person does something overtly or makes a mistake. I don't think calling the police will do any good. I agree with that, Jerry, but it's so frustrating. I'm tired of all this confusion, and I just want whoever it is to leave us all alone. How does Melanie perceive this? She is very upset. When I came home, she was in tears. I'm not surprised, especially after the ordeal the first one caused. Look at him, I think Melanie is pretty fragile right now. Between all of this and the fact that she's so close to graduating, I guess she's a bundle of nerves. You must take care of her as much as possible. Do you think we should both just block all mail from this account? This may turn out to be a mistake. If he sends anything else, I think you'll want to know about it. Yes, you're right, but how can I protect Mel? For starters, if you get another one of those damn letters, I wouldn't tell her about it, at least not right away. For that matter, I think you should check her email on your laptop every chance you get. If she receives another letter, you can forward it to your email before she sees it. This way you don't have to interfere with her. Yes, I think that's a good idea. 
He got up. I'm really sorry you had to be dragged into all this. If this is supposed to be an apology, then I don't need one. You are very dear to me, and I will do everything to help. He smiled gratefully. I better go home to see how Melanie is doing. He started to walk away, then turned, hugged Gary, and kissed her on the cheek. Thank you for being such a good friend. Having you by our side through all of this means a lot to me. When Adam returned home, he was pleasantly surprised to find Melanie in a much happier mood. The next morning, she was even more cheerful and got up early to have breakfast with her husband. This is a real holiday, Melanie. I don't see you that often before I go to work. Well, I didn't want you to leave this morning without being able to say I love you, she told him, kissing him. By the way, she added, I wanted to be sure to let you know that I'm going to a lecture on campus this evening. A few girls and I are going to grab something to eat after this, so I'll probably get home pretty late. Of course, Mel, everything is fine. We have a lot of leftovers in the fridge, so I can grab a snack here. Thank you, darling. I'll probably come home after school to drop off my school things and change clothes. If we don't see each other, have a good evening. Knowing that Melanie wouldn't be home, Adam stayed late at the office. For a change, business was starting to pick up. A large potential client really liked samples of the new product, and Adam hoped they would place a trial order. At least something is becoming clearer. Now I just need to get to the bottom of who is playing email games with Melanie. He was still thinking about the mysterious good friend when he entered the house. As he started to walk into the bedroom, he noticed Melanie's laptop sitting on the table. I don't think she needed him for the lecture. Then he remembered Gary's proposal. I wonder if she still checks her email. If so, then we need to check if she received anything new from this bastard. The laptop came to life when he opened the case. The email page wasn't open, so he clicked on the Gmail link to see if it was registered. When he did this, a window opened asking him to select an account. He saw Melanie's email, but it had been unsubscribed, so he started closing Gmail. Before he had time to do this, he noticed a second account under her regular mail, and when he looked at it more closely, he froze in bewilderment. The name of the account was Good Friend. What the hell? He exploded, staring at him. He tried to open it, but Google asked, Enter password. Not knowing the password, he closed the tab, then sank into his chair, trying to comprehend what he had just seen. How could she have an email account with that name? I know that Gmail doesn't allow two users to have the same address, but that means Melanie was the one sending those other letters. Why would she do this? Why would she send me an anonymous letter in which she accuses herself of having an affair? Only after a moment did the answer reach him. It must have been a distraction. She wanted me to chase some gay professor in South Dakota because she was having an affair with someone else. Then another thought hit him like a punch to the stomach, her trip to Florida. When I showed her the letter, she pretended to be very upset with me. She told me that she was going to visit her mother, that she needed time away from me. Now I wonder if she even saw her mother. He quickly took out his mobile phone and pressed his mother-in-law's number. When the elderly woman answered, he spoke politely for a minute and then said, tell me, Melanie and I were thinking of coming to visit next month. Will it be too soon to see us again? Too early? I haven't seen you for ages. Please come when you can. He ground his teeth in anger. Good, excellent. We will contact you when we've decided on a date. Having said goodbye, he broke the connection and cursed. What a bitch. I wonder where Melanie actually went. And more importantly, I wonder who she went with, bitch. Then he remembered the last letter, the same one that Melanie received. What was this for? Damn, this must be just another distraction to take her mind off of her while she goes to lectures with her girlfriends. What a vile lying bitch. It made him wonder what she wore when she went out for the evening. He hurried back to the bedroom and began sorting through his wife's underwear. It was difficult for him to remember everything about Melanie, and he had almost given up. But a sudden suspicion gripped him, and he returned to check one more item. A garter belt. He was absent. Angrily, he looked for a suitable bra and panties. But they were gone, too. Went out for dinner with some girlfriends, huh? He put everything back and returned to the kitchen table to think, so you love sabotage and deception. Well, two can play this game. When Melanie returned home after midnight, he was still seething, but pretended to be asleep when she tipped to it into the bedroom. When he heard the shower turn on, he did everything. He could not to stand up and attack her. Who would have thought that going to lectures would be such a sweaty job? He thought bitterly. The next morning, Adam got up very early and left for work before Melanie even woke up. Next to the coffee pot, he left a note for his wife. I hope you enjoyed yesterday's lecture. I had to leave early for a meeting at work, and I might be late today, so don't wait for me. For Adam, it was indeed a busy day, but his meetings were not with clients or suppliers. 
During lunch, he did a little shopping and then headed home with some of his purchases to do a few preparations. After that, he went to two more meetings, which took up the entire afternoon. When he finished, he went to dinner and a movie to kill time. Melanie was already asleep when he climbed into bed, trying not to wake her. However, when she woke up the next morning, she found her husband waiting for her. I thought you had left for work a long time ago, honey, she said, gratefully accepting the cup of coffee he handed her. I wanted to make sure to see you this morning because I have a flight to Detroit at noon. I'll be out for a few days generating leads. This is something new. You don't have to travel so often. So when do you think you'll be back? Not until Friday evening. And if everything goes well, I can only leave there on Saturday morning. Can you cope here while I'm gone? She gave him a bright smile. Do not worry about me. I'm sure I can find something to do while you're gone. Fine, just remember to stay away from our good friend while I'm gone. Her face darkened. It's not funny, Adam. Sorry, you're right, it's not funny. He then waved his hand at her, picked up his suitcase, and headed towards the car. He frowned as he pulled out of the driveway. She didn't even notice that I didn't say I love you. I bet she's already making plans to meet her lover again. Now I just need a little distraction to make sure her meeting takes place here at home. Instead of going to the airport, Adam left his office at lunchtime and went to the airport. Adam left his office at lunchtime and went to the university. Parking off campus, he walked briskly toward the Graduate School of Business. He had shed his usual sports jacket and slacks and was now wearing jeans and a sweatshirt. He had a cheap backpack slung over his shoulder. Without raising his head, he headed to the reading room of the School of Business Library. The few students there did not pay any attention to him as he casually walked behind the rack of periodicals. Once he was out of sight, he pulled out a string of the largest firecrackers he could buy, lit the extra long fuse attached to them, and tossed them into a metal container for disposal. He then casually walked to the nearest door, propped it up with his backpack, and walked out. Once outside, he took out the phone he had purchased the day before and called campus security. Come quickly, they're shooting at the business school, he shouted excitedly when his call was answered. I think there may be several of them. They're still shooting. He then turned the receiver towards the library, and within seconds, a series of fireworks began. He cut the connection and hurried across campus to his car as sirens blared and people began running in all directions. He was parked in his neighborhood and watching from his spot when an hour later, he saw his wife's car pull into his driveway. Then a second car pulled up behind her and a male figure appeared. In times of danger, there is no place like home, Adam muttered, grinning sadly. He then got into his car and drove to the motel where he had booked a room. Late that evening, he drove around his neighborhood one more time to make sure the second car was still in his driveway. Then he returned to his room and tried to get some sleep. When the adulterous couple left the house the next morning, they were surprised to find Adam leaning against the stranger's car door. God, Carl, this is my husband. Melanie gasped when she recognized him. I thought you were in Detroit, she stammered, and then caught herself thinking, realizing how it sounded. Darling, everything is not as it seems. Carl just came by to just stop, Melanie. Every time you open your mouth, you are only lying. I don't want to hear it anymore. He bared his teeth and gestured at the two of them. Every time you open your mouth, you are only lying. I don't want to hear it anymore. He bared his teeth and gestured at the two of them. That's exactly what it sounds like. I know you both spent the night here, and I have a record of everything you said and did together. So stop talking and listen. He grabbed the manila envelope tucked under his arm and handed it to her. I'm filing for divorce on the grounds of adultery. Inside, you will find the name and number of my lawyer. Find yourself a lawyer and ask him to contact mine. But don't try to contact me because after what you did, I don't intend to see or talk to you anymore. No, honey, don't say that. It was just a one-time mistake. We can work things out, I promise. I said stop lying, he growled. This is not a one-time incident. You have been having fun with him for several weeks, and it definitely wasn't a mistake. You planned everything in advance. I know you sent that letter as a distraction so you could spend spring break together wherever you went. And by the way, your mom wants to know why you haven't visited her lately. I guess you were so wrapped up in that piece of crap, he guessed. Cheered at the Sulan man that you didn't even go see her. He paused to turn his attention to Melanie's lover. Yes, that reminds me. Adam quickly took out his cell phone and took several pictures of the amazed man. When he realized what was happening, the man growled, clenched his fists, and took a threatening step towards Adam. Adam immediately reached into his jacket pocket and extended his hand far enough to show the handle of the gun. Oh, 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 he said calmly. I wouldn't do this if I were you. 
I have no intention of ruining my life by killing you, but I will be glad if you give me a chance to shoot you in self-defense. Stop, stop. The man raised his hands up and took a step back. Adam turned to Melanie with a grin. Looks like your boyfriend is a lover, not a fighter. Then his voice became cold and hard. Take everything you need from the house and then get out, Mel. Don't be here when I get back. I wasn't kidding when I said I never wanted to see you again. Adam, please, she wailed. I never wanted it to be this way. He ignored her and walked to his car when she sat down on the driveway and began sobbing into her hands. On the way to his office, Adam sat down on the driveway and began sobbing into her hands. On the way to his office, Adam stopped at a dumpster and threw away his phone along with the toy gun he was keeping in his pocket. I'm very glad that these things look so realistic. He grinned mercilessly. Returning to his desk, Adam used his cell phone to send an email containing one of the photos he had taken. To his surprise, he received a call back a few minutes later. This is Dr. Mayfair. Did you just email me a photo? Dr. Mayfair, forgive me for intruding on you again, but do you happen to recognize the man in the photograph? I think his name is Carl. Is the woman standing next to him your wife? I'm afraid of my ex-wife. Very beautiful woman. I think she was in one of my classes last year. As for the man next to her, I actually recognize him. His name is Carl Mannheim. It so happened that he is one of my dissertation students. Carl Mannheim. Good to hear, doctor. I'm afraid I have a score to settle with your Mr. Mannheim. So he was the serpent who stained your Garden of Eden? Yes, in a way. But I'm afraid that my Eve was far from innocent. It's clear, very interesting. Well, I'm glad I was able to help you, although I'm sorry the result wasn't what you wanted. Thank you, although I'm sorry the result wasn't what you wanted. Thank you, doctor. I appreciate your time and your help, despite how things turned out. Well, good luck to you, my boy, and don't lose hope. Everything always works out for the better. Take it from someone who has been there and made it to the other side. Two months later, man, I sat opposite my lawyer and was annoyed. Have you heard anything from Melanie's lawyer yet? How are things going with the divorce? Yes, yesterday I spoke with Hannah Montrose, and today she sent a counteroffer to Melanie. The good news is that Melanie has decided not to fight the divorce anymore. Apparently, after Hannah heard the recordings you made in your home, she convinced your wife not to risk having them played in court. But the bad news is that now that Melanie has accepted that the marriage is over, she seems intent on getting as much out of you financially as possible. Crap, she lies and deceives me. And when she gets caught, she expects me to pay her for the privilege. It's just not fair. What does my cheating wife want? I usually expect to see a request for the division of all your property. But in this case, there is nothing to divide. You rent, you don't have a pension plan, and you have very little savings. The only asset you have is a share in your business, which is operating at a loss. Apparently, she expects him to fail, so she's only asking the court for alimony. I certainly appreciate her vote of confidence in me. Adam snapped sarcastically. So how much alimony does she want? Much more than we offered. The lawyer handed the sheet to his client. Adam looked at him and gasped. This is ridiculous. She knows I can't afford it. If I have to shell out that much money every month, I'm essentially liquidating my business to pay her. What can I say? Melanie refuses to negotiate, so Hannah will propose just that to Judge Abernathy. Well, I'm not going to give up and give Melanie that much money without a fight. We'll have to take our chances in court. Okay, Adam, I understand what you're getting at. But remember, Judge Abernathy has absolute power. You are left with whatever he decides. Almost exactly a month later, Adam sat in the courtroom and waited anxiously. After both lawyers presented their arguments, Judge Abernathy adjourned. How do you think things are going? Adam asked his lawyer in a whisper. I have no idea. It could go either way, or the judge could decide on some kind of compromise. They were soon ordered to stand as Judge Abernathy returned to the courtroom. When they were seated again, the judge asked opposing counsel to come to the bench. I assume your clients have not changed their position on the financial settlement? The two lawyers exchanged glances. No, Your Honor, very good. Before I make my decision, I would like to ask Mrs. Weatherby a few questions. Hannah Montrose looked scared, but then smiled and motioned for Melanie to come forward. Everything will be fine, she whispered to her client. Don't forget to address him as Your Honor. Adam's lawyer took his seat and leaned towards him. It's usually not a good sign when the judge wants to hear more from the other side. Adam watched sorely as his soon-to-be ex-wife testified. The suit she wore was conservatively cut, but fitted enough to show off her figure. He noticed the judge was watching Melanie and shook his head. I think we're finished, he whispered to his lawyer. 
The judge scanned the papers in front of him and then turned to face the woman sitting in the witness box. So, Mrs. Weatherby, it appears that the only issue separating the two of you is the amount of alimony that should be awarded. Your offer involves an amount significantly higher than that which your husband offered. That's right, Your Honor. And how do you justify the amount you proposed? We are asking for a higher amount in recognition of my years of marriage and the fact that I will have to start my life essentially from scratch, Your Honor. It's clear. However, Mr. Weatherby claims his only source of income is the company he founded, which is still operating at a loss. Why do you think Mr. Weatherby can afford the financial support you offer? Your Honor, we argue that Adam is deliberately reducing his true income by siphoning funds into his business. He could easily pay the child support I'm asking for by simply modestly adjusting his current investment level. Boom. The audited financial statement shows negative cash flow. Your Honor, Adam's accountants can manipulate the numbers to show any result they want. The judge raised his eyebrows. Are you saying that the financial statements are fraudulent? Lawyer Melanie turned pale and shook her head decisively. Melanie noticed this and quickly caught herself thinking. No, Your Honor, not at all. Simply, earnings can be deferred and investments accelerated, all within the bounds of generally accepted accounting principles. He invests too much in his company, that's all. Adam felt his blood pressure rise. He leaned over and whispered angrily, What a bitch. She knows it's not true. She's just trying to pressure me to get what she wants, no matter the consequences. Meanwhile, Judge Abernathy reviewed the case summary in front of him. Until now, we have focused on your husband's investment in his business, Mrs. Weatherby. From what I can see here, Mr. Weatherby has also invested heavily in you, or at least in your education. If you mean my MBA, Your Honor, then it's true that Adam paid for my tuition. But I was the only one who worked, did the hard work for all the courses, took all the tests, and wrote the dissertation. I've worked day and night for the past two years, including last summer, and you just graduated from university, is that right? Yes, sir, I graduated with honor, she said proudly. He nodded, very good, Mrs. Weatherby, that's all. You can sit down. When Melanie stood next to her lawyer again, Judge Abernathy raised his glasses and looked at both sides for a moment. Having heard all the evidence, I intend to award Mrs. Weatherby the full amount of financial support she requested. Adam winced and Melanie leaned over and hugged her lawyer, but the judge wasn't done yet. This financial settlement equates to a monthly amount that will allow Mrs. Weatherby to live quite comfortably without working for the foreseeable future. However, she has just completed a college degree that should prepare her for a high-paying business position. To give her additional motivation to use her expensive education, I am awarding Mrs. Weatherby alimony for six months only. Six months, you can't do that, Melanie cried. I can, and I did it, answered the judge. Then he hit the wooden block with a hammer. Next thing, her lawyer quickly pulled Melanie away from the bench, even as she continued to try to appeal the decision. Only the appearance of a large bailiff convinced the unfortunate young woman to stop her actions. Do I only have to pay child support for six months? I can live with that, Adam told his lawyer as they stood up and began to walk out of the courtroom. How about this, Adam's lawyer answered happily. I thought we lost when the judge picked her number, but I guess he wasn't too impressed with the way she tried to milk you dry. However, not many husbands behave so well in divorce court. I wonder what made him take you so easy. You don't think the fact that she pleaded no contest to the charge of adultery was a factor. He should not have taken this into account when determining the financial settlement. Adam looked back again to see Melanie still arguing with her lawyer and chuckled, well, whatever it is, I'm happy with how it turned out. At that moment, the hand touched his shoulder and Adam turned to see an elderly man whom he had never met before but who seemed vaguely familiar to him. I wanted to introduce myself, explained the gray-haired man. I'm Professor Mayfair. Adam grabbed his hand and shook it firmly. Professor, it is an unexpected pleasure for me to meet you in person, sir. Thank you again for your help. What brought you to court today? The elderly man smiled. After our conversation, I became interested in your case, so I decided to drop by to see how everything turned out. Then his smile grew wider. It also gave me the opportunity to say a few words to an old friend of mine, Judge Abernathy. He shook Adam's hand again. I'm glad everything turned out well for you. If I'm ever able to help again, I'll be happy to do so. He winked. We divorced husbands must stick together. When the professor left, Adam looked after him. Interesting, he muttered, then shook his head. As he did so, out of the corner of his eye, he thought he saw Gary in the crowd of spectators. But when he turned to look, she was not there. It took a hell of a long time before she pressed a familiar number on her mobile phone 
and when the call was answered, she hesitantly said, Hello, Jerry. It's me, Melanie. Melanie, what a surprise. I haven't heard from you since you moved to Florida. How are you doing? To be honest, it's been a pretty tough few years. Actually, that's why I called. I really needed to talk to a friendly interlocutor. Certainly, tell me how you're doing. Are you working on it now? Actually, that's part of the problem. I thought that with my MBA, I would have no problem finding a good job. But it turns out that employers here are more interested in experience than an academic degree. Most of the jobs I was offered were internships or internships. My God, that doesn't sound very profitable. So where did you end up? When the alimony stopped, I was completely desperate. I even got a job as an administrative assistant for a while. But it was terrible. So now I have started a new career in financial advice. Actually, that's one of the reasons I called. I can analyze your financial situation if you don't mind. You'd be surprised how many people neglect these things. There was a pause for a moment. Melanie, I'd love to help you, but my finances are in good shape right now and I'm pretty confident about the future. I really don't think I need help. Sorry. It's okay, Jerry. I hear this often, but I decided to try it. It's so hard to get a foothold in this business. In fact, I had to move in with my mother to reduce expenses. Do you live with your mother? What happened to you and Carl? Don't even mention that bastard's name. We broke up just a few months after we arrived here. Did you break up? What's happened? Jerry, that was terrible. Carl dropped out of school without earning his MBA. I don't know exactly what happened, but his advisor rejected his master's thesis and told Carl that he would have to start over. Carl felt very bitter and decided not to return. He refused to look for a job and hung around our apartment all day long, playing video games and drinking. After a while, he began to take out his resentment on me. It got to the point that at some point I had to call the police on him. Melanie, how terrible for you. I think you're lucky to get rid of him. And look at it this way, now you can freely go out and meet new people. Have fun and go dancing whenever you want. I remember how much you missed all this when you were married, Melanie sighed. Nightclubs and parties require money, Gary, and I don't have a lot of spare cash right now. And to tell you the truth, when I go out, it's not as glamorous or exciting as I used to think. In fact, I remember one friend warning me that there were a lot more creeps out there than good guys. She paused, but when Gary didn't say anything, Melanie decided to change the subject. What about you, Jerry? How are you doing? Are you dating anyone special right now? Actually, my situation has changed quite a dramatically, Mel. In fact, I'm getting married next month. Mary? It's amazing. Who is this lucky guy? I know him. Yes, actually, you know, this is Adam, Melanie. Adam and I are engaged. My Adam. Are you engaged to my Adam? You can't do this. I'm afraid I already did. We'll have a small civil ceremony in the backyard of our new home, and then we'll fly to Paris for our honeymoon. New house, honeymoon in Paris, Adam can't afford all this. Not only my situation has changed dramatically, but also Adam's situation. The same month you moved to Florida, he received that big order he had been working on for so long. After that, his business really took off. Clearly, his new product is just what the auto industry needs, and that is not all. Earlier this year, Adam received an offer from a large manufacturer to buy his business for a fortune. He agreed and the deal will be completed next week. So as you can see, you don't have to worry about our financial future. Melanie could only stutter, but Gary persisted and now her tone had changed. You know, all this could have been yours, Melanie, but you weren't content with what you had. I warned you from the very beginning that you were risking everything by starting your little affair. Besides, I warned you that there would be women who would happily pick up the pieces if your marriage fell apart. But you were the one who encouraged me. It was you who came up with how I could. Suddenly, Melanie's voice rose in shock. By God, Jerry, it was you. You planned everything from the very beginning. Suddenly, Melanie's voice rose in shock. By God, Jerry, it was you. You planned everything from the very beginning. All I did was tell you about a harmless little fantasy. You manipulated me into acting in accordance with it. You tricked me into believing I could get away with having an affair. Actually, Melanie, you're exaggerating. I didn't force you to do anything you didn't want. All I did was give you enough rope to hang yourself. I cannot believe this. I bet you were the one who warned Adam about Carl. You're smarter, Melanie. Think about it. If I told Adam, he'd wonder how I knew. That wouldn't be very smart of me, would it? On the other hand, I told you not to delete your secret Gmail account and told Adam to check his email. I used mail all the time, so I was sure he would see what he saw. So no, Melanie, I didn't tell Adam about your lover. All I did was arrange the dominoes so they would fall where I wanted them to fall. I cannot believe this. I trusted you, Gary. 
I thought you were my friend. Gary laughed. You know what they say, all's fair in love and war. You won't get away with this. I'll make sure Adam knows what you did. What a schemer you really are. He will definitely call off the wedding as soon as he finds out the truth. I'm very sorry, Melanie, but I'm afraid I'll have to interrupt our little conversation. Adam and I have plans for the evening, and I want to look extra good for him. And don't bother calling back. I'll block your number as soon as I hang up. You are an insidious, vile bitch. Jerry greeted her future husband with a kiss when he came home from work. Adam kissed her back and then pulled a piece of paper from his jacket. You won't believe who sent me a letter today, Melanie, really? Jerry said casually. I almost forgot about her. What does she need? Adam looked at his bride impassively. Actually, she wrote to warn me about you. She says you planned everything that happened just to separate Mel and me. It's pretty wild. Can I see? Asked Jerry. He handed her the printout. She glanced at it quickly, then handed it back to him with a smile. Poor Melanie, she could make her little jealous fantasy halfway believable if she added one more thing. He looked at her curiously. She winked at him. She should have signed it, good friend. It took him a few minutes to stop laughing. Thanks to everyone who took the time to listen to today's stories. If you enjoyed it, please consider liking and subscribing if you haven't already. Feel free to share your thoughts on the events in the comments below. Take care.